Drop yourself in. Void were prohibited. Not available in the state of shock. <laughs> hey everybody, Dan Schindler here on Drum Talk TV. Welcome to another episode. This is from the Hidden Gems series featuring Paul DeCibio. How are you, Paul? Great. How are you doing? Thanks, Great. Dan. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I want to have Paul on for a couple of reasons. One is the main reason because he's a great drummer. And as I've gotten to know Paul, I've found out even real recently, like within the last few minutes, really how diverse your playing is. So we'll get into That's talking great. about that. Um, Paul plays with John Zito's band, which does a lot of nights at Vamp. And if you've been to Vegas, where I'm based here with Drum Talk TV, Perhaps you've been to Vamp. It is the best rock and roll club I've ever been to, and uh, Eat, it's yes. It's Eat, so drink yeah. rock Vamp yeah. Vegas. It is best, so cool to best have best rock a place club in like Vegas. That. Yeah, these days, yeah. you know, Absolutely. when I played in and around Hollywood and the Sunset Strip and all that, you know, there was like Madame Wong's, the Whiskey, the Roxy, and all that stuff. But this is so cool to have. 30 years later or whatever and still be so relevant and all the memorabilia there's all these old vinyl Aussie albums and I even have that picture disc too nice. I felt this there <clears throat> but also some great choppers built by Danny the Count Coker who Counts is customs yeah, yeah and we'll talk a little bit about that as yes. well but let's start with where your drumming started being that you're so versatile we'll get into versatility but you started what when you were a little kid right like yeah a lot of us do. Uh, i was nine years old actually yeah got my first drum set um you know my parents kind of they wanted me in sports they wanted me in boy scouts all this other stuff i didn't really take to very well so i really liked music and my mom said you know you could do one or the other because <laughs> So I chose I chose the music and uh, started playing when I was nine, taking lessons, you know, private lessons with a, a cat named Mike Carrado down at uh, Eddie Kramer's Music World in San Carlos. Cool. Way back in the day. And I gotta ask, when you were nine, because I think we're around the same age. Um, what were you listening to? What influenced you musically when you were nine? Well, definitely, uh, you know. Zeppelin and Sabbath and Hendrix. Mm -hmm. um, my brother, I'm the youngest of six, so okay. all my older brothers and sisters were still, you know, listen to a lot of music. Yeah. Um, my mom was really into it, you know, like Neil Diamond, and right. of course my dad was a, a Sinatra groupie, so right. all we listened to in the car was Sinatra and, so and was all this the big band stuff. Like but, early '70s. Yeah. Well. Okay. So I mean, I was. I don't want to reveal my age, but yeah, okay. it was the early 70s. <laughs> well, I'm That's 51 cool. in a few days, and he's about 10 years younger. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, right. <laughs> when you started taking private lessons, did you, was it the kind of relationship with your first drum teacher where you were, aside from learning rudiments and stuff, you were able to tell him, hey, this is the kind of music I want to play, teach me this, or was he more leading than that, or how did... No, how he was did, he let, me, he let me bring stuff in, you know, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd want to learn certain songs, but then at that time I was actually playing in church, so uh -huh. I had to learn a bunch of church songs, so I'd bring those in. Right. And uh, some stuff we'd, we'd read, you know, charts, and... Uh, which, which paid off later on in life because I played in jazz combos and stuff like really? that. Really? Where I actually had to read stuff and it was, you know, but... Talk about how <clears throat> important that is because there's so many drummers that don't think important. they need that. It's way important. Um, both theory-wise and just uh, musically, you know, playing the drums, the approach. Uh, mm -hmm. Understanding what the other just instruments knowing, are doing. Yeah, knowing there's a structure and... You know, every song has, you know, beginning, middle, and end, and dynamics, mm -hmm. all that stuff. When it's on paper and you can read it uh, precisely every time, mm -hmm. it makes the music so, you know, so much more uh, just uh, colorful or, you know, brings right. it to life, I want to say. Yeah. Because every element's written in and... and you can see all the layers and what the construction of it is so therefore right. you know I mean, what you may not be able to, be. to create it the first time or whatever but eventually you, you realize you know wow this is this is how it's done so right. it's That's really cool. important to learn you know the reading and the counting yeah <laughs> drums is all math and uh, yeah you know, i you know, love saying that so. my, like some guys that are heavily into theory totally disagree with what i'm going to say but i believe that music is math that you can hear especially the drums 
because okay. all our music that we read, um, if it's for drum set, as opposed to uh, mallet instruments and everything, it's right. it's all rhythmic as opposed to so much more melodic. It's written out not so much for scales, but for the actual instruments that you're hitting. So to me, music's always been math that you can hear. It's definitely mathematical. I mean, yeah, you don't really have to think of it so mathematically, but right. it turns out, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of math in. Did you play in uh, like junior high and high school and all that? Yeah, I um, not. I wasn't in a school program through junior high, but uh, I did do like um, oh god, I think I was in a um, a singing group in, in seventh grade. But mm. high school definitely got in the jazz band and uh, you know tried to get a, a band of my own going. Right. Parents had built a studio in the backyard for me, so cool. That was more of my. Um, you know, drum room mm -hmm. friends would come over and hang out, you know, yeah. smoke weed, whatever, <laughs> just <Right>. come in. <laughs> but yeah, uh, thank God I had that room because I was able to just lock myself in there for hours every yeah. day and uh, just go for it. Is know. that where a lot of your development came from in your drumming, from those years and hours of just locking Definitely. yourself up? Definitely. That and, uh, you know, just, um, any. I, my teacher was really great and he, um, instilled this thing in me where if, if, if there's somebody I really idolize or want to, you know, like model their style, go seek them out and, and take a lesson from them or mm -hmm. try to, you know, track them down and really, you know, get, you know, just say hi or whatever. Yeah. Were you able to do that? I was. I was able to do that. Uh, Tim Alexander oh, wow. um, did it with, uh, let's see, I had a brief lesson with Steve Smith, came oh, through cool. town. Um, Greg Bissonette, yeah. um, God, Colin Bailey, Jerry, oh, really? Jerry Grinnell, yeah, Colin Bailey, the, the he lives world's, up there. world's fastest right foot. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Grinnell, uh, who's another jazz great, played on all the Peanuts and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, it was. What did you learn from Colin? Colin taught me some great technique, With foot, foot technique, yeah. and uh, just. Uh, building exercises, you know, like mm -hmm. practicing uh, the double kick, uh, the single kick, right. right, you know, right hand, right foot, right hand, left foot, left yeah. hand, right foot. That kind of, yeah. that kind of practicing technique just it, it really, really pays off when you're when you're playing long sets and you know, yeah. you d you just have the control and yeah. the dynamics that you need. I mean, it's, yeah. and you're working less, I think. When Pretty you much, have all that. because if you don't have to think about it, you know. You're freed up to look at the audience, to you know, to breathe, to to whatever you know. If you right. you drop a stick, grab another one. You don't have to think about the yeah the tune. So yeah. Now, yeah. when you were in the band Puck in Northern mm -hmm. California, it was a heavy metal band. Yes. Was that kind of like your first real band experience, where you went through all the motions? You guys wrote original material, you recorded it, played it out. Not not really. I mean, it was a it was a a real you know, a solid experience where basically I came into the band. The band leader, um, Clay Bash, how you doing Clay, I hope you're out there. Um, he was a um, custom bike builder and uh, he had his, his vision with the band, so I came in after his vision was already pretty much established. His tunes were written, so I had to learn the stuff. And then uh, he wanted just to get a good solid recording and then maybe go out and play around, but um, it wasn't really like a, you know, a team effort thing. It was more of a, I was kind of more of a hired gun for that. Mm -hmm. But it worked out pretty cool. I liked the music. Um, I think we only did one gig. Was it good? It was great. Good. Uh, <laughs> both people loved it. Um, so, <laughs> thanks so mom and dad. It's nice that your parents have to <laughs> say that. <laughs> yeah, I went through that too. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that was like, one of the very few speed metal bands I ever played with. So. But I like speed metal. It, uh, you know, and I was in uh, a couple other bands before that, original acts that were, uh, it was more of a team kind of a, you know, like, let's do this, you know, hey, you know, friends get together, all right, let's do a band like this. And yeah. one of them was called The Monsters. Oh. Uh, another one was Ragtop. Both those were around the Bay Area. Right. You know, so. Now, you take your love for speed metal 
and you combine that with all the chops you learned in jazz band, the jazz combos, people like Colin Bailey, Tim Alexander, Greg Bissonnet, all those people, and then you end up playing with uh, three-time Grammy Award winners, uh, our opponent, Queen Ida, in Zydeco. Right. How does one... <clears throat> Because, you, you know, let's face it, a lot of musicians and a lot of drummers get very stuck in their own box and they fall in love with this style of music, and that's where they keep themselves. Right. What was it that attracted you to their project and, and also, of course, made you able to be able to play it? Because there's such a, right. a difference between speed metal and Zydeco, I think. And, yeah. and by the way, i got to ask you, was Al Rapone also a custom bike builder? Because no. it seems like you've played for a lot of custom bike builders. <laughs> no, no. Well... Uh, First of all, Al Rapone was, was incredible. Uh, Zydeco uh, accordion player, mm -hmm. endorsed by Honer, um, but uh, six-time Grammy nominee, three-time Grammy winner. Wow. Um, his nephew was one of my best friends, Mark Matoyer. He's a bass player, and we played in bands together over the years. But after high school, he's, his uncle, Al, ended up taking him on tour. It was actually our last year in high school, so he missed out on some, uh, some crappy school days. And I was <laughs> jealous. <laughs> and uh, he comes back halfway through the tour, and he's like, hey, uh, after this tour's done, we're going to be losing our drummer. Do you think you want to audition? And I was like, oh, wow. Had because you ever listened I'm to that like, kind of music? Had you heard of it uh, before? Yeah, I'd heard of it because she was big in the Bay Area. Okay. Um, they'd been around for years, but uh, it wasn't you know, my thing or anything so but it has a heavy blues you know it's blues music so. yeah anyway I I studied the stuff for a month or two and then auditioned and uh, ended up getting getting a gig uh, a lot of fun I did it I did it mostly because of a, yeah the opportunity to tour and go out and make money as a band um, on the Grammy winning level, we did a hard rock tour, all the hard rock cafes. You know. we all over to, the U.S.? We went around the U.S., up to Canada, a couple places, went to Hawaii three times, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, did a lot of, did a lot of cool stuff. So, and then of course in New Orleans, we were there for a month or two, playing around. Uh, lots of fun. Yeah, you know, I think that no Playing matter... Good old Cajun music. Yeah, yeah. which is fun music. Yeah. Really fun music. Yeah. Um, there's a great spirit in that culture, and it absolutely comes through in the music. Yeah. But I think that traveling is important, no matter where someone's from, or even if you live in exo an exotic place. I think traveling is really important, and if you can travel and play music and get paid for it, that's not a bad combination. Well, I mean, you gotta you gotta share the music with the with the masses, you know, get it out there all around the world. So, you know, just like I was in the Bay Area, I didn't really experience Cajun music, you know, from the heart, from any you know, from any perspective. So, but once I was out in it, playing it for the people, and saw the effect it had, it really just kind of. Uh, you know, it had a whole nother, a whole nother, uh, you know, perspective for me. You know, it was just like, this is great music. <laughs> yeah. This is really powerful stuff. So. How did it help your chops? If it, did? Like, I mean, it really helped my chops. Um, all the marching and the rolls, um, and just paradiddles and flams and, you know, all this rudimentary stuff in the beat. Like so. Dixieland and Ragtime House. Too, which is there's similar, a lot of New Orleans similar, there. yeah, and it's it's jazz, it's um, it's basically uh, God, it's jazz, it's blues, and it's Latin, all kind of mashed together, you know. So and it and it swings from each style during the song. So you can be playing a, a blues, you know, did dun did da did dun, you know, and then it'll go into more of a swing. And then all of a sudden you're in this Latin ding dang ding 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 you know. So it's fun stuff. That's cool. I loved it. Buy some of it. Yeah. If you've never heard it, and that goes for any music, any music that you hear people talk about that you haven't heard or you don't play, get it and get exposed to some other stuff. It'll help you play whatever you do like to play the most. That's what I have found anyway. Al Rapone and the Zydeco Express, Queen Ida and the Zydeco Express. Very cool. Now, how long have yes. you been in Vegas, Paul? I moved here October 31st, 1998. Oh, so you've been here for a while. Yeah. Longer than I have. <laughs> I've been here six and a half years. Cool. 
Yeah. And how'd you hook up with John Zito? Zito, I didn't meet until, wow, probably 2007. <clears throat> and what were you doing during those nine years? Were you playing around in local bands? or? Yeah, I actually moved here. Um, first gig I had was in a lounge band. I went down to Jerry's Nugget and met, met oh, this wow. cat. And, and uh, I just got to go out and start meeting people, you know, introduce mm -hmm. yourself. Yeah. When you come to a town like Vegas, unless you know somebody that can do that for you, you got to go out and, and beat the streets, you know, yeah. just get your face out there. Tell them your name, what you do. Mm -hmm. If you could sit in, do that. I did. I did all those things, and I uh, ended up in a lounge band called The Vision. Yeah. We played around. Uh, like we got lucky, got a gig at Bellagio oh, for cool. for six months. Um, you know, played Jerry's Nugget, uh, played down in Laughlin, up in Mesquite. Oh, cool. Um, eventually, got really tired of that guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's, and uh, started doing a lot of stagehand and um, audio tech stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. So, um, you know, it's decent money here in Vegas. There's a, there's a lot of those kind of gigs. Yeah. So, and uh, eventually ended up getting an audition at Blue Man Group. Oh, cool. So, um, I ran into a, a cat. Jeff Totora, very good, good friend of ours. Yeah, he's Great been drummer. on the show a couple yeah. of times. In fact, while we were setting up, I got a text from Jeff. Oh, cool. he's playing somewhere tonight. So we'll yeah, give with uh, Jr. Beatbox. Yeah, that's what it yeah. is. Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, Jeff got me my audition at Blue Man, and um, I got the audition. Auditioned actually right before Blas Elias. He was in line behind me. Oh wow, it was funny. Um, we both got hired cool. a day. Um, I started training as a part-time drummer, uh -huh. and then eventually got offered uh, the drum tech position, oh. which had immediate benefits and better pay, so I t mm -hmm. of course I had to take that. Yeah. And um, ended up working there for five years. Uh, it was great. That's and, cool. Uh, dream job. Yeah, yeah, uh, look for the interview with uh, Jeff Tatora um, on Drum Talk TV. It gives you some really good behind the scenes stuff about JT. the music is put together. Yeah, he's a phenomenal drummer. He's yeah. of course also has uh, his own band. Tinnitus. Tinnitus. Yes. And he also is uh, in, I'm having a pre-senior moment. <laughs> he's playing with Frankie Perez. Right? Frankie, Perez. Frankie Perez. But the um, Ubershaw. Ubershaw, Ubershaw is just Ubershaw. phenomenal. Yeah. Elvis Litterer. Yeah. Kicking ass. Bro. Yeah. Great, great drum ensemble. So check Jeff out. You'll know what all this hubbub is about that we're having over him. But um, so now you play with a few different things here with. Uh, so then, yeah, Danny, of back course, to the, John. the story. Yeah. Um, eventually hooked up with John uh, through some other friends, other uh, drummers. Of you know, fill in. You meet cats. You yeah. sub around town. So met John. We hit it off. John Barry Barnes and myself. We just clicked, you know, mm -hmm. the first time we played. Uh, oh, it cool. was a jam night. And uh, and eventually I started doing more gigs with him, filling in. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we became friends. Um, I eventually got laid off from Blue Man after 9-11. Oh. And the uh, um, way things were, um, I started doing audio stuff mm -hmm. around town. And then I met a cat named Chris Frazier, who's an incredible drummer also. Chris Frazier. Uh, he hired me to be his tech for the White Snake tour. Oh, cool! So I went out with White Snake for a year. Oh, great. Did a world tour. Great. As the drum tech, uh, incredible. Did you like doing that kind of work? I loved it. It was, it was so much fun. You know, being a part of uh, such a big team that mm -hmm. was uh, a big production. So huge in the '80s, and yeah. Chris is such a phenomenal drummer. To watch him every night was a lesson in itself. Yeah. You know. Does he live locally? He lives in L.A. Okay. Yeah. That's he used to be here. To me, he used to be here. He had a, <laughs> had a house here in town. I did some work on his house, and that's how we, we kind of became friends. Oh, cool. So it cool, worked cool. out great, though. Great. So talk about, um, before we talk about the new CD coming out, depending on when you watch this, it might already be out. Um, 77. 77. Before we talk about that. Sorry, gang talk, signs. Talk, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> talk a little bit about <laughs> the recording process with John. You don't have to go into too much detail, but. With Zito? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that CD. I hear you guys play that music a lot. So I'm, I try yeah. to get to almost every Wednesday. We pretty much took a live approach to that recording. Um, we went in as a three piece mm -hmm. and just, you know, of course, 
we had sort of a road map, but uh, we had uh, Jason Constantine in the studio mm -hmm. recording uh, engineer, and of course Jason Froberg, the phenomenal. Right. Um, he's an incredible engineer over yeah. at Vamped and uh, down at, at uh, Desert Moon Productions. So we just kind of hammered at it, you know. Yeah. We played the live tunes. We wanted that kind of loose vibe, you know. The, the live feel so mm -hmm. but at the same time he came back and tracked on some really great uh, slide work uh, some vocals that you know, used the like the am radio type yeah. of mic on it i mean it's just it's really some great swampy blues with some hard rock driving you know, tunes we had a blast i doing can see it. how that recording process suited the music perfectly yeah so yeah we did you know we did maybe one or two three takes per tune Pick the best one, and uh, you know, I laid over some percussion afterwards. Uh, we got some cool stuff, you know, the rain stick. And, uh, I'm eager to hear the CD because I've only heard these pieces live. Oh, well, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah so yeah. I'm eager to hear. It's something. Yeah. It's it's definitely a tighter vibe on the record. So. In fact, they're hearing it now because it's the under track you're hearing, but I haven't heard it yet. I've only heard it and seen it live. I can't hear it. <laughs> Oh, oh, there's Cyrus. <laughs> and then working with Danny Coker and the album is going to be on April 29th. Oh, man. Called? Incredible. Yes, April 29th, mm -hmm. uh, Count 77 debut record release. We're doing a, an album signing at Zia Records here in Vegas. Mm -hmm. So get your butts to Vegas. And that's uh, on the 29th? That's you the 29th. Doing the signing? Okay. Then uh, four days later at Vamped, we're doing a uh, record release party. We're playing uh, Count 77 is is doing a huge show. We're playing probably 10 cuts off the album. Oh, so cool. that's going to be it's going to be huge. And you may and know the count from um, Counting Cars, which was a show that was born out of uh, Pawn Stars. So yes. just to give them a little bit of context of who who it is. And did he write all the music? Did he work with Stoney and John on the music? Or yeah, we kind of co-wrote the tunes uh, with producer Mike Varney. Oh, yeah. Uh, Shrapnel Records. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Excellent producer. Great. Yeah, um, yeah Mike is, uh, he's incredible in the studio. Um, I don't want to say mad scientist, but that's what comes to mind. Yeah, uh, well, there you go. <laughs> he's, uh, <laughs> man, that guy knows his stuff, and uh, we definitely got a great product coming out on the 29th. Great. Excited, Can't really excited. That's so, cool. are you guys going to tour it? Does yeah, we eventually we're going to we're going to be doing some touring. We've got a lot of um, you know, weekend shows this summer. Um, I'm not really sure who all we're going to be playing with, but I know uh, Jackal's definitely on the list mm -hmm. and uh, a few other bands I know you all have heard of. So, so cool. keep your ears and eyes open, looking for Count 77 this summer. Yeah. We're going to be out there. Yeah, and I was just going to say, the website's right on the screen if you want to order it, check it out, and look them up. Um, now, I want to ask you, I do this with most of our interviews, I want to ask you a Paul DeCibio fun fact. All right. Okay. With all the traveling that you've done, where have you gone where the, whether it's the people, the architecture, the spirit of the town... Where did you go where it was so much more than you even imagined? And what was it about it that really got you? Oh, man. So many places. Um, again, when I was on tour with Whitesnake, mm -hmm. we went around the world, South America, um, you know, Australia, New Zealand, Europe. Um, they're all so incredible places that yeah. I've, I've only seen in books, you know. Yeah. But then to see that, especially the South American, uh, you know, down through Brazil, um, Peru, mm -hmm. Chile, all those countries are so incredible. Um, then Europe, you know, just the, the architecture and the buildings. I'm I'm in a draftsman as well. I do oh. computer aided drafting, and oh, wow. I grew up in construction. Um, I'm a carpenter, so seeing all that stuff over there, so so old and still so fresh, you know. Yeah, man. relevant. Yeah. yeah. I don't think there's really one place. Yeah, <laughs> Cause it's hard to nail down. I just, isn't it? you know, every every place you go in the world is is, is wild. But uh, oh man, so I guess the like if you're saying the craziest time uh, for me it was has got to be like the Zydeco band. We were in um, Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. Virgin Islands. Yeah. 
that whole tour um, we <laughs> has my first 151 experience with rum oh. because because <laughs> of the islands you know, yeah and, and they were just throwing rum at us for free uh, <laughs> we had so much fun down there uh, and was uh, the reception the, well for the music or did yeah you take they really off? love the cajun music down there um cool. it's you know it's been in there it's steeped in their traditions so yeah. um and we had a blast uh and, and it's definitely some some bad hangovers but uh <laughs> <laughs> we had some fun moments. Uh, our band leader, Al Rapone, is a legend. Uh, yeah. yeah, I learned so much from him, but uh, watching him on stage is also so entertaining. Because really? What a showman. That's it was great. always great, great time. Just cool. Drummers yeah. definitely have the best seat in the house. Yeah. You know, from what we see from our perspective, no, nobody yeah. else sees that. I mean, know? being out on, on tour with Whitesnake was great, but I was a tech didn't really get to experience a lot of the um you know the hoopla and stuff the, right. but we had great times anyway it was quality yeah. um it was a five-star tour i mean but being a band member and like in the cajun band and going on tour and doing it that way was was a whole greater experience and that's cool. i think anybody who plays drums and has a dream don't give up you keep on pushing for that dream it's gonna happen yeah you know yeah, you can very do it. Cool. Even even if it's a, a genre of music you never thought you'd be playing, go for it. Yeah, and see the world, you know, see the country, yeah. whatever you can do. Yeah, yeah. Get paid for it. Yeah, all you young cats that are just locked into speed metal and, and being one way, explore other music. Yeah. It'll pay off. Such great advice. Thanks, Thanks. for coming on, Paul. Thank Pleasure you for having, having me, you. Man. Sure, and no I problem. really enjoy hanging out. Thanks, when we man. can Wednesday nights and yeah, see man. you guys play. You sound great. Well, thanks Always for come out oh, and thanks. play. I appreciate you guys letting me sit in. I really do. No problem. It's a lot of fun. Anytime. I don't, as I tell people, I don't really play with other musicians anymore. I just play with myself, as my wife says, right yeah. back here. <laughs> no, I didn't mean that. <laughs> come on, people. <laughs> I just throw on my CDs and I play. So it's been fun to start going there Wednesday nights and be able to sit in on a song or two with it different is. people each time and do that that'll help your yeah. playing too definitely yeah. get out to jam nights um, the john zito electric jam at vamped is a it's a unique thing in itself um i don't want to say it's invitation only but we get a lot of quality players out there mm -hmm. um you know we get a lot of beginners too but uh, we try to keep it um a higher level of yeah. uh, musicality i mean nobody's exempt from coming in you know we're not saying oh you can't play but you know Put something together and come on down and, yeah. and, and put it out for the people. So, you know. Yeah, very so cool. Good description, yeah, too. It's, it's a blast. We do it every Wednesday, middle of the damn week. There you go, the way so. it should be done. That's what happens <laughs> on tour. It doesn't matter what day it is, you're working. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining Paul and myself Thanks. here on Drum Talk TV on the Hidden Gem Series. And again, here's the website right here where you can check out the new CD from The Count that Paul is slamming away on. Yeah, check that out. And uh, watch for more fun Drum Talk TV interviews at drumtalktv.com. Thanks for joining us.